Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. It really is good to be together in worship. We're glad that you're joining us from wherever you are. We say here at Chapel Street Church, we want to be a place for where you are. And so wherever you are, uh, we're glad that you're with us. We hope that God speaks to you now through his word. Let's pray and ask God to do just that. Father in heaven, thank you for your word, which you've told us is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword. It's able to divide our minds and our hearts, our thoughts, and right, cut us right down to the soul. We don't always like that, but we confess that we need it. So, Lord, do that for us today. We pray in your name. Amen. A number of years ago, I was asked to speak at, uh, at a, a relatively uh, important civic function. Uh, actually, I was asked to pray, to give the invocation at this function, to open this event in prayer. And uh, I agreed to do this because it was a friend that I knew who had asked me to do so. And then I received in, the, in an email a list of instructions about this prayer. And among the instructions was, I was instructed not, I was requested respectfully, please do not mention the name of Jesus in your prayer. I thought, hmm, ooh, this is going to be a problem for me uh, as, a, as a Christian pastor, as a minister of the gospel. I'm not sure that I feel comfortable praying and not mentioning his name. And so I, I pushed back a little bit and said respectfully, I'm not going to pray in a way that would offend people. I'm going to be, you know, clear, but I, I, I am going to pray in Jesus' name. And they kind of we're firm on this. No, please don't mention his name. And so, long story short, I basically said respectfully, I'm not the person, I'm not the guy for this job. You need to have someone else to pray because if you're going to ask me not to pray in Jesus' name, then I'm not going to pray. And I've thought about that a lot since that incident a number of years ago. Why does the name of Jesus cause such a reaction in our culture? I mean, you could have a conversation about God in general in a coffee shop with people. You could have that discussion, and people might have opinions, but they wouldn't have the same visceral reaction to the name Jesus. Or you could talk about Confucius or Muhammad or Buddha or the Dalai Lama and have lots of conversations, and people have opinions, but they don't get as worked up as they do about the name of Jesus. Why is that? What's that really about? Well, first of all, this is not anything new in our culture. From the time he walked the earth physically, Jesus has been a dividing line for people. His name has been uh, caused conflict and controversy and called people to make a decision. And that's not without some of God's own intent. And really, from the 21st century all the way back to the first century and everything in between, the name of Jesus is, is a dividing line. And it's a question we all have to answer. We all have to come to the place in our lives where we're going to answer, what do you do with the man Jesus? How do you answer that? In fact, you could make the case that Christianity at its core is coming to grips with the identity and the authority of the person of Jesus Christ. And so this is the central question we're going to answer in this part of our series on the Gospel of Mark. We're in a series called Following the King. What does it mean to understand who Jesus is and to follow him with my life? And we have been seeing that over the last seven chapters of Mark, Jesus has been slowly unfolding or revealing in stages who he is to his disciples. And they're slow to get it, as we are sometimes. But this is sort of the linchpin, uh, crescendo, big reveal moment in Mark's gospel, what we're going to look at today. And where he makes it clear, crystal clear to his followers, his disciples, who he is, and what it really means to follow him as our king. It's the central question at issue and at stake here. Now, the passage is going to be well known, at least part of it, to many of you, uh, and there's a surprising twist. As we've said each week, Mark is uh, unfolding who he is. More accurately, he's inviting us into the disciples' own process of discovery of who Jesus is. So, without any further uh, introduction, let's read Mark chapter 8, verses 27 through the end of the chapter, verse 38. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea and Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. 
And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Okay, that is a, uh, probably a familiar, at least some parts of that were familiar to you, even if you're not a regular reader of the Bible. It's a, an, an incredibly powerful and important passage for us, one that is often misunderstood then and now. This is the central question here. The account of Peter's confession of Christ occurs in every one of what we call the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And there's a reason for that. It's a crucial moment in the disciples' journey. Peter often becomes sort of the, the mouthpiece speaking for the rest of the disciples. He's impulsive, he's the first one out of the boat, and he often speaks up and says what other people are thinking. And in a way, that's exactly what's happening here, and Jesus is, is dealing with that. The setting for this moment is really, really fascinating and important for us to understand a little bit of the context and the dramatic scene here. As I mentioned a moment ago, this is the crescendo moment, the, the critical moment in which Jesus is going to reveal his true identity and, and by asking these questions. And he picks a particular place to do it that might be, we might miss if we don't understand. He says it's the, the villages or the region of Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea, named for Caesar. Philippi, named for Herod Philip, that's one of Herod the Great's sons, the ruler in the northern part of Israel. So it's uh, named for Caesar, Rome, and the puppet king, uh, Herod Philip, of that region. It's a region outside of Galilee, in the far northeastern edge of Israel, mostly a non-Jewish population, and it had a very interesting history. In the Old Testament, it was a center for Baal worship, pagan Baal worship, the worship of the god Baal which God was frequently condemning and rebuking his, his, the Israelites for falling into Baal worship. And in, in the Greco-Roman times, it was a center for, um, the city was named Paneas for the Greek god Pan. It was the center for the Greek worship of the god Pan. It was basically a center, a place of filled with ancient pagan uh, worship, full of idols. Located at the base of a cliff, uh, with the Temple of Caesar on top. You'll see here an image from, uh, taken from our trip to, uh, to this very region. The pillar here in the foreground is part of an ancient temple to Pan. You might notice in the rock faces here, there's these niches cut out that were places where pagan idols were stored. And this cavern there on the lower left side by the pillar, that was called the Mouth of Hades, or the Gates of Hell. Remember when Jesus in Matthew 16 said, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. This is the place in which he said that. So, and at the top of this cliff was, it's all ruins now, was a temple built to Caesar. So think about this. Jesus chooses this location with Caesar worship at the top, and below uh, de temples to the pagan gods of, of the ancient Israelite, of the p ancient pagan uh, people before Israel, and of the Greek gods, Pan, and this cavern called the Mouth of Hell, the Mouth of Hades. In that dramatic place, he asks the question about his identity. It's no accident. This is very intentional. The whole region stands kind of on the border between two worlds, between the political kingdoms of Rome and Caesar and of Israel and Jerusalem, between the spiritual kingdoms of God and the forces of, of, of his kingdom and the forces of evil and darkness. Incredible symbolic contrast for Jesus to have this conversation about his true identity. I, you have to imagine that his followers, his disciples are thinking, why in the world has our rabbi brought us here? This is a place that Jews don't go. Why would we be here? Well, he tells us why. Let's look again at verses uh, 27 through 30. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way he asked his disciples, 
who do people say that I am? What's the word on the street? What's the opinion out there? What's the buzz? What are the crowds saying about me? And they answer. Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? That's the critical question. Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. So there's a lot in here. Jesus asks essentially, what's the word on the street? What's the buzz? And the disciples say, well, there's a lot of talk, Jesus, but no one's exactly sure. There's some that think you're Elijah, uh, the, one of the prophets, the precursor to the Messiah. Some think you're John the Baptist come back from the dead. Some think you're one of the prophets, and they have these. So there's, there's scholarly opinion, there's speculation, there's popular cultural notions, but none of them is quite right. And by the way, I think the same thing is true today. If you ask people, what about Jesus? There are lots of opinions. He's a myth never existed, great moral teacher, spiritual master, all kinds of opinions. Even the, even the Quran, even the Muslim faith has a place for Jesus, one of the prophets. But none of them are right. None of them have them exactly right. And I think in the popular opinion of today, we too, in fact, many of us in the church have wrong ideas about who Jesus is. Let me read to you just a couple of what I would call the cultural myths about Jesus today. There's the American patriot Jesus, who's against tax increases and activist judges, who is for family values and owning firearms, and who turns the map from blue to red. There's the left-wing Jesus, who's against Wall Street and Walmart and for reducing our carbon footprint and the anti-capitalist mascot for social causes of the day. There's the self-help Jesus, who helps us cope with life's problems and tells us how valuable we are and not to be so hard on ourselves. There's the spirituality Jesus, who hates religion, churches, pastors, priests, doctrine, and would rather have people out in nature finding the God within and listening to ambiguously spiritual music. And then there's the life coach Jesus, a wise, inspirational leader who believes in you and helps you find your center so you can become a better you. He gives you the 10 to 12 steps to live your best life now. There's Guru Jesus, who is best buds with Buddha, Vishnu, the Dalai Lama, and Deepak Chopra. There's Starbucks Jesus, who drinks fair trade coffee, loves spiritual conversations, drives a hybrid, and goes to film festivals. There's open-minded Jesus, who loves everyone all the time, no matter what, except for the people who are not as open-minded as you are. There's touchdown Jesus, I like this one, who helps athletes run faster and jump higher than non-Christians and determines the outcomes of Super Bowls. There's the gentle Jesus, who is meek and mild with high cheekbones and flowing hair and walks around barefoot wearing a sash and looks very Euro. There's hippie Jesus, who teaches everyone to give peace a chance, imagine a world without religion, and help us remember that all you need is love. There's yuppie Jesus, who encourages us to reach our full potential and our earning potential, reach for the stars and buy a boat. There's revolutionary Jesus, who teaches us to rebel against the status quo, stick it to the man, and blame things on the system. There's boyfriend Jesus, who wraps his arm around us as we sing about his intoxicating love in the secret place. There's defense attorney Jesus, who gets you off the hook when you're in trouble and you keep him on retainer until you need him again. And more recently, there is the post-church Jesus, who is down with deconstructing the church of your youth and lets you worship him on the couch or however you want or not at all. He's not really that worried about it. We could go on. I think you get the point. And here is the point Jesus is making to his disciples when he asks that question, what do the people say? They're wrong. There's all kinds of opinions, partial truths and corruptions and distortions, but they're not who I am. And when I read through this list, maybe you chuckle, maybe you roll your eyes, maybe you cringe. The truth is we all have our misguided notions about who Jesus is, and they're, they're not him. So part of what this passage is doing is helping us deconstruct our own false notions of who Jesus is. Okay, this brings us to the first uh, section, the confession. The confession. You know, it's interesting to me that Jesus does not explain or defend himself. He doesn't break down these false notions of who he is. He doesn't go down the list and say, I'm not Elijah, I'm not John the Baptist, and here's why. He doesn't do any of that. He makes it personal. He takes it from the theoretical, what are they, what's the word on the street, to the deeply personal. What do you say? What about you? Who do you say that I am? And that is the central question that this whole passage is about and its implications for our lives. 
Who do you say that I am? Peter's response, you're the Christ. You are the Christ. Uh, Matthew's gospel puts it a little more, gives a little more detail about Peter's response. Matthew chapter 16, verses 16 and 17. Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, that means son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Here's what he's saying. You got the right answer, Peter, but you didn't get it because of human wisdom. You didn't figure this out on your own. The Spirit of my Father, the Holy Spirit, revealed this to you. God showed you this, is what he's saying. Now Peter, like all of the disciples, grew up with the prophecies of the Messiah. He knew about the promised deliverer, the anointed one, the king who was to come. And when he says you are the Christ, that is more title than name. We hear the word Jesus Christ, and you might sort of default, think of that as his name. Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus is his name, Christ is his title. Christ uh, comes from the root word meaning the anointed one, deliverer, Messiah, king. That is precisely what Peter says. You're the one we've been waiting for. You're the one I grew up hearing about and praying about. You're the one. You're him. But Peter didn't get this from God. But what's really amazing is what happens next. Because you'd think it might end there. Got it, Peter. Good job. You got the right answer. But what Jesus says next is, is amazing and, quite frankly, confusing. That's why we're calling this section the confusion. There is confusion among the disciples, and I think in our own minds and hearts today as well, when we come to this question of who Jesus is. Peter gets the right answer to Jesus' question, but Jesus is about to reveal to Peter and the rest of the disciples, and us, how little they understand what they just said how much they don't grasp what, what, they, what this means for him to be the Messiah and the King. Let's look at verses 31 to 33. And he began to teach them, that's crucial, that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. That's a crucial phrase. Not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. That's a crucial phrase. So there's so much in here. Jesus, right after Peter gets the right answer, Jesus says, Let me talk to you. Let me teach you some things. He begins to teach them. And the first thing he teaches them is what must happen. This is crucial. Think about this. Peter has just said, I know who you are, Jesus. I know who you are. You're the righteous branch that Jeremiah talked about. You're the king who will have a government on his shoulders that Isaiah talked about. I know who you are. You're the one I grew up longing for and praying for. And that we used to set a, ta- a chair for the coming of the Messiah, Elijah, to point to you, the Messiah who would come at every Passover meal. Uh, I know who you are. Jesus says, exactly. And I must die. What? Wait, What? That's not, in, that's not how I grew up understanding this. That makes no sense at all. What are you talking about, Jesus? You're not supposed to be the, v- the victim. You're the victor. You're not supposed to be killed. You conquer. You're the king. You're supposed to deliver us. What are you talking about dying? This makes no sense. Notice, in verse 31, he begins to teach them. And the first thing he teaches them is the Son of Man, his favorite way to refer to himself, must suffer and must be killed. He doesn't say, oh, I'm telling you, this is a a tragedy is coming. He doesn't say it's going to work out this way. I wish it wasn't so, but he's not not looking into this crystal ball and saying, it really stinks, but I'm going to die. He's saying, this must happen. This is the Father's will. There is no other way. Why? Why is that true? Why is it true that the Messiah, the long-awaited king, must suffer and must be rejected and must die. Well, we don't have time to get into all the reasons, but let me give you three briefly. Number one, the Old Testament predicted it. Isaiah 53 is often referred to as the lost chapter because many Jews don't read it and understand the suffering servant. Isaiah predicts in detail the suffering of the Messiah and his sacrificial death. Number two, the justice of God requires it. 
Hebrews chapter 9 and chapter 10 tell us that there, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. So all the blood of the bulls and goats in the Old Testament at the altar and the temple were pointing to one who would be a perfect sacrifice, the Lamb of God, John said in the Jordan River, who takes away the sin of the world. And number three, our sin and our salvation desperately need it. Jesus is in effect saying, there must be a death, there must be a payment, and I'm going to pay. If I don't, you will have to pay, and you can't pay. It would cost you your life, you would be obliterated. But I'll pay in your place. First Peter chapter 2, verse 4, or verse 24 tells us this very thing, that he bore our sins in himself on the tree, that we might be liberated and set free. But the disciples don't grasp this at all, and frankly, many, many of us in the church today don't either. And they, they, which is why Jesus tells them to keep quiet about him. Do you notice that? In Mark, there's this messianic secret. There are a number of times, and here's one of the most pronounced ones, where Jesus says, hey, hey, don't tell anybody. Keep this quiet. Why? Why does he say that? Well, because they're, they're very misunderstanding. That the Messiah is not a military hero, is not a political king but as a suffering servant who will die in their place. And they have no category for this. They have a lot of learning to do. And Jesus is saying this, like, I, you need to learn some things about my kingdom that you don't grasp. So even though you have my title right, you don't yet understand who I really am. So rather than shouting about it, let's learn. Let's learn together. Now, Peter responds to this by pulling Jesus aside. I think this is hilarious. Peter basically pulls Jesus aside and said, let, let me explain the Old Testament to you, Jesus. I mean, how crazy is this? He pulls him aside and, and rebukes him. By the way, this, the Greek word for rebuke is the same word used when Jesus rebukes an evil spirit. Peter's using strong language. Jesus, stop talking this way. It's bad for morale. You're bringing people down. What are you, like he's, he's correcting his rabbi, which is just ridiculous. And the text says that Jesus turns and he sees the other disciples. So Peter has pulled Jesus aside, trying to correct him, you know, being Peter. And, and just pause there for a minute. How often do you in your own mind and heart sometimes want to pull Jesus aside and explain some things to him, correct him, tell him what he doesn't understand about your life or the situation that we're in or what he ought to be doing different than he is? Jesus sees the other disciples and realizes this is a crucial moment, not just for Peter, but for all of his followers, including us. And he says to all of them, he rebukes him. He turns it back on Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. How would you like to have Jesus say that to you? Get behind me, Satan. He calls Peter Satan, which is crazy. Why? Not because Peter has a, is possessed. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, Peter, you don't realize it, but you are speaking the opposite of the will of the Father, which by definition is satanic. You are opposing what God wants. Here's the point. Jesus says, you don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of man. A mindset on the things of man will always see the cross as foolishness and offensive. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 through 24. The cross is foolishness to Greeks and a stumbling block to Jews. It makes no sense because they don't have the mind of Christ. They, and Jesus says this to Peter. Here's what he's saying basically. Peter, I've heard this before. Where has Jesus heard this before? Do you remember the wilderness temptation? Remember the third temptation? The first, turn, the, turn these stones to bread. The second, cast yourself down. The angels will, will save you. The third, worship me and I'll give you all the earth. In other words, you don't have to go to the cross, Jesus. You could have what you want, which is all people bowing down to you, in, by, short, by shortcut. Take the easy way. And Jesus said, rebukes Satan, and he rebukes Peter. Peter doesn't realize it, but Jesus is saying, to deny the cross is to speak the words that oppose the will of the Father. He said, I've heard this before, Peter, and I'm not going to take, I'm not going to listen. We're not going that way. You don't understand how my kingdom operates. This brings us to the cost. The cost. In this next section, Jesus expands his teaching by calling the crowds to him, which is fascinating. Up to this point, he's been speaking to his disciples specifically, the 12. 
Now he calls the crowds to him. Uh, and it's a familiar passage to many of us. But Jesus intended it to reprogram his followers' thinking. So 2,000 years ago, Jesus gives what comes next as a way of reprogramming their understanding of what it means to follow the king. And I believe that I need and you need the same kind of reprogramming today. Mark chapter 8, verses 34 and 35. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, this simply means follow, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. That's, this relates to this right here. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. I'm, I'm, this is a familiar passage, but think about this. This is shocking. It's not familiar at all to the disciples. Jesus is basically saying, not only am I going to die, which blows your mind, but you also must die. <laughs> what? Messiah, king, deliverer, what, what are you talking about? We're supposed to be victorious and reign with you. Well, yes, but not the way you think. Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, that means follow. It's a question. If you want to follow me, if anyone would, if you would, would you? If I would, if you would, come after him, follow him. What does that mean? To follow Jesus is not just to confess that he's Lord. I think, and I'm guilty of this too, we shrink down what it means to be a Christian to just saying the right things, just saying that you believe the right things about him. The Gospels tell us that even the demons believe that and they shudder. Being a follower of Jesus, following the King, the title of our series, is not just confessing that he's Messiah. It's receiving him and living his way. Well, well what does that mean exactly? Jesus tells us in this often quoted but rarely understood uh, phrase, deny yourself Take up your cross and follow me. That's what he says. So following Jesus equals self-denial and cross-bearing. That's the formula. To follow Jesus equals two things, self-denial and cross-bearing. Well, what, what does that mean exactly? It's crucial for us to understand this if we're going to follow the king. This is, this is first let's talk about what it's not. This is not Jesus telling us to deny our personality. He's not saying you lose your distinctiveness, you lose your individual uniqueness. He's not saying you die as a martyr. He's not saying live an extreme life of self-deprivation, asceticism, detached from all earthly things. That's not what he's saying. He's not just saying deny yourself stuff. He's not talking about self-denial like a form of self-discipline, like you know, dieting and exercise and self-discipline. He's not talking about denying yourself things or stuff, although you might need to. He's talking about denying your self. Denying yourself, denying what's, what's at the center of who you are right now apart from Christ. It's the self. To follow Jesus means the self must be denied, must be denounced, must be dethroned. That's crucial. That's what he's after. What does it mean to follow Jesus? To say the right words? No. Only if they lead to self-denial, self-dethronement. This is a hard, hard teaching, frankly, for 21st century Americans. Our whole culture is built around the elevation and the celebration of the self, frankly, the worship of the self. It's how we operate. Recently, I read a book by Carl Truman called The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. I recommend it to you. It's, it's not easy. It's a thick book, heavily footnoted. Uh, Truman's a, a church historian and theologian and pastor, but he writes, I think, brilliantly on this subject. And here's a quote from, from the first chapter. The intuitive moral structure of our modern social imaginary prioritizes victimhood, sees selfhood in psychological terms, regards traditional sexual values as oppressive and life-denying, and places a premium on the individual's right to self-determine, that is, to define his or her own existence. All of these things play into the legitimizing and capturing what we might call the spirit of our age. It's a complicated quote, but he's exactly right. The, the moral structure of our modern, the moment that we're in, our culture, prioritizes the self, he's saying. The self is at the center 
of how we view the world, of how our culture decides what's good and what's bad even. There's so much talk today about the importance of self-care, about self-talk, about self-acceptance. You know, we say things like, don't be so hard on yourself, or give yourself a break, or be kind to yourself. And to be sure, self-loathing is not at all what the gospel is advocating. Jesus is not talking about that at all. And there is a place for taking care of yourself. But one of the best, the best thing you can do for yourself is to recognize that yourself that inner voice that wants to rule and control and have its way is not your savior, can never be your savior, and is a terrible master in God. It will undo you. That's the message of the gospel, which stands in direct contrast with our culture, which says, no, 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 no. The self is to be accepted, and the self is to be elevated, and you get in touch with, and that's how you know you're living a fulfilled life. And the gospel says, no, to follow the king is to deny the self. It's completely upside down. Even saying this, I know some of you listening are squirming. You're bristling. There's a part of you that wants to, wait, 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 and wants to qualify, wants to rationalize, wants to reject. So do I, quite frankly. But the best thing you can do for yourself is to surrender it to Christ. This is what scholars call uh, the law of inversion, when Jesus says you must lose your life to find it. So he goes on and he says, take up your cross. Well, what does that mean? Now, this is not Jesus' way of, of talking about, uh, you know, hard things that happen in our life. Here's how I hear people talk about cross-bearing today. They talk about, you know, uh, I'm facing this hardship. I lost my job. It's my cross to bear. I, I got sick. Or my, uh, it's my cross to bear. I'm taking care of my elderly parents. It's just my cross to bear. I'm dealing with this difficult relationship. Well, it's my cross to bear. That's not what Jesus is talking about here at all. Those things are real. We need his strength and grace to deal with them. But when he says, follow me, he's not saying you, taking up your cross means you're going to have some, some irritations and some hardships in your life. So talking about something profoundly different. Cross bearing was not a metaphor used in Jesus' day. Think about it for a minute. In the first century, when Jesus says, take up your cross, we hear that as a Christianese, like it's a, it's a churchy way of talking. In Jesus' day, nobody talked that way. It's a crazy analogy. It's a crazy metaphor. It's a shocking and quite frankly offensive metaphor. The cross was an instrument of torture and death, an instrument of subjugation and surrender. If you were t carrying a cross in Jesus' day, it meant you were under the thumb of Rome. You were in total surrender and submission and you're on your way to die. And that is his point. That's his point. To follow the king means submission, surrender, and death to self. We're on our way to die, as he has died, so that we might live. I know that, as I said, this is a hard teaching for those of us in 21st century American culture. But it's precisely the way of the king. The way of the king is the way of the cross. Here's how the Apostle Paul puts it beautifully in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm not living. The self is not ruling. The self is not on the throne. Christ lives in me. He reigns. He rules. How? Because he loved me. And how do I know that? He died for me. So the life I am living in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's the fundamental message that Jesus is getting through to his disciples here. You're right, Peter. I'm the king. I'm the Messiah. I'm the long-awaited one. But not like, you, not like you think. Not like you have, can ever possibly imagine. And Peter is confused by this, and there's a great cost to this. So taking up your cross, then, is the means by which you deny yourself. The self must die. Why? So that Christ can reign and give us back our true selves and the life he meant for us to live. This is the final point, the call. Jesus, praise God, Jesus doesn't just leave us on our own to wallow in this and try to figure it out. And I think sometimes Christianity, the Christian message stops there. Deny yourself, take up your cross, try hard you know, to suffer well enough that Jesus would love you. That's not the gospel. It's the law of inversion which contains some powerful promises. The call to follow the king contains power, 
powerful promises. Actually, three that are seen to us here in, in four, uh, the four words for, F-O-R. I'll explain in a minute. Let's read through this passage. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? And the fourth one, the fourth four, for whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father and with the holy angels. These four fours give us the three promises that are contained in this call. Let me explain. First, for whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. The first promise is you will find your life. Jesus is the Savior. We don't save ourselves, but his point is when we surrender, when we take up our cross, which is a way of putting to death my need to have my way, my need to be in control, my need to call the shots in my life, when I lay that down, then I find a life I could have no other way. You, you will not find your life by building your best life now. You will not find your life by earning it, by working for it, by achieving it, by grasping it. You find your life, the gospel says, by releasing your need to have your way. And then you're given back something you could never imagine. A life far beyond your wildest dreams. A life with the presence and grace and fullness of Christ now and forever. But you don't get it by holding it. You get it by releasing it. The second four is actually two of them. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? So the second promise is you get your soul. You keep your soul intact. And the, the, convert, the converse is this. If you chase after the things that yourself wants, achievement, wealth, popularity, notoriety, um, stuff, you know, comfort, security, if you chase after those things, you lose your soul. You become soulless in a sense. You might have all those things. You might, you might not, but you might achieve them. But in the process, you lose your sense of self. You lose a sense of who you really are in Christ. So the second promise, you keep your soul. And third, for whoever is ashamed of me, of my words, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in glory of his Father and with the holy angels. Jesus puts this in the negative, but the fourth promise is, or the third one is, you will enter glory. You find your life, you keep your soul, and you enter glory. That's what he's saying. And you don't get that by achieving it, by accomplishing it, by demanding your way, by putting yourself on the throne. You get it by dethroning yourself daily, putting to death on the cross, yourself. Here's how A.W. Tozer puts this. In every Christian's heart, there is a cross and a throne. And the Christian is on the throne till he puts himself on the cross. If he refuses the cross, he remains on the throne. Perhaps this is the bottom of all of our issues today. We want to be saved, but we insist that Christ do all the dying. No cross for us, no dethronement, no dying to self. We remain king or queen within the little kingdom of man's soul and wear our tinsel crown with all the pride of a Caesar. But we doom ourselves to shadows and weakness and spiritual poverty. Jesus has died for you. He's put to death in his body all of your sin, past, present, and future. Our job then is to die to ourselves, which is constantly trying to take back the throne of our own lives. Recently, I was thinking about what this means, practically speaking, and I came across a post on Facebook by a dear, dear friend who's suffering from bulbar ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. We love her. Her name's Laura. We've watched her suffer. Uh, and she reached out when she was first diagnosed, praying for healing, praying for a miracle, praying for alternative treatments. But above all, she asked us to pray that God would be glorified in her suffering. And I can tell you, without doubt, he is. Let me read to you a portion of what she wrote. She begins her post by talking about all the things that are diminishing, all the, the abilities she's losing as the disease takes slowly its course. Then she writes this, here's the truth. Every night as I fall, I'm falling asleep, I try to go back through my day and thank God for every good thing and all the ways he showed his hand, his presence, his love and provision. And this is always so easy. But the other night, in the middle of the night, when I couldn't sleep, I started thanking God for all the things I can still do. Thank you, Lord, I'm able to breathe easier today. Thank you, Lord, I can still walk with a walker. Thank you, Lord, that I'm able to still feed myself. Thank you, Lord, I'm able to type so much today. But then, as the middle of the night thoughts often go, 
I started thinking that all those things will be gone very soon. And then what? What am I going to do then? What will I be thankful for then? It was then that I heard God whisper to me, me. Be thankful for me. So I changed the wording to thank you, Lord, that you have promised to be with me. Thank you, Lord, that you love me. Thank you, Lord, that you are in control. Thank you, Lord, that you will heal me either this side of heaven or the other. I change the I to you because God is always constant no matter what our circumstances. And at the end of the day, as my strength diminishes and my body fails, I am more dependent on his strength and I cling to his promises. What does it mean to follow the king with all of our physical faculties intact or when you're losing them all? It means to lay down my need to have my way. Laura is learning that in a profound way that's teaching me that his promises are true. What's offered to you is, is, is of infinite value and worth. Jim Elliott said he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Why would I struggle and fight to hold on to something that's not worth anything and I can't keep anyway? When what's offered to me is a life I could never imagine in his presence, a soul that's at peace and intact, and the promise of entering his glory. Friends, let's follow the king by deny our, dying ourselves, taking up our cross, and trusting him above all else. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this familiar passage that your son spoke to his disciples over 2,000 years ago, and he said it to reprogram their minds about what it means to live in your kingdom, and we desperately need the same kind of reprogramming. We too have our false ideas of who you are. We want to fit you, Jesus, into our nice, neat little boxes. And you, in your mercy and your wisdom and your grace and your love, are showing us that that cannot be done. Give us the courage that comes only from you to dethrone ourselves and to submit and to surrender to you. And then and only then will we find life. We pray this in your sake and with great gratitude and joy in our hearts. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Jeff. Wow, what a great service today. Hey, if, if what we talked about in today's service, is, if that has moved you in any way, um, if, if you've learned something new and you'd like to process that or discuss it further, please reach out to me in the comments section or you can text hello to the number showing on the screen. I would love to talk further about this with you. Um, if you're like me, you, you felt challenged of who you believe Jesus to be, that there's so much more to him than what we often see or believe. Um, and further, if, if this is something that's been helpful for you, if this service has been helpful for you, I'd like you to, encu I'd encourage you to share this service. You can click like, and you can click that share button if you're on Facebook or YouTube, or just grab the URL and, and invite a friend to church. So I would love to encourage you to do that. And now as we go out from here, um, I'd like to encourage you with these words from that Jeff spoke about today. May we get off our throne and pick up our cross and follow our King. Bless you, church. Have a great week. Is complete.